It's time to get sexy on Secular Sexuality. Hello and welcome to Secular Sexuality, the ACA show reminding you that Frankie says relax. I'm Christy Powell, and my co-host tonight knows how to live those dreams and scheme those schemes. Welcome, Puck. <laughs> well, hit me with those laser beams. How you doing? <laughs> All right. And our guest tonight is here to teach us how to make making it our intention. Welcome, Melissa Hargrave. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me today. I appreciate it. That's it. I don't know. We can go. What's next? <laughs> Oh, sorry. It's my... <laughs> well, all right. We got to just relax and we're going to get to it. And when you want to call, feel free to call the show at 512-991-9242 uh, or call, go to tiny.cc slash call sex because the show is coming right now. You know, it's okay, Puck. A little bit of performance anxiety, a little bit of like getting all worked up right before everything is about to pop it is kind of natural and uh, kind of exactly what we wanted to jump into tonight. Uh, we are here to, to talk a little bit about, I guess, uh, sexual anxiety or anxiety and sex and, and how they all overlap and, and get mixed up with each other. I know that, that sex can be uh, sort of a, a cause of and, and something of a solution to anxiety. Uh, but Melissa, what does uh, anxiety look like in the context of sex? What are, what are some of like the signs and, and symptoms of sexual anxiety? Ah, okay. I'm glad you asked that. Anxiety's main operation, a mode of operation is avoidance. So more often than not, we'll see folks avoiding sex. Um, there's also, uh, it, it can go the opposite direction. It can be a um, compulsion towards, right? So we want to have it more often because we're anxious. Got to have that. It makes us feel better. Um, and then sometimes doesn't. But either way, uh, we're kind of um, pulsing towards it. How do we recognize that type of anxiety in ourselves? Ah, well, and I guess I should also say that, you know, anxiety tends to impact our thinking, our behavior, our um, how we feel in our body. So um, oftentimes what we really want to figure out is how people are thinking about their sexual intimacy and um, how they see themselves, how they see their partners, um, how they view sexuality in general. It's um, There's actually a lot that goes into how anxiety can show up. Yeah, so then it becomes really difficult, I think, to, uh, I guess, differentiate between anxiety and, and excitement. Or, or honestly, for the purposes of this conversation, what we might call arousal. Is there, you know, a, a litmus test or, or how do we make that distinction? Ah, uh, yeah, you know, this is, this is, you're touching on an interesting question. Um, there's this idea that some people don't feel as much desire or I hear the word libido. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, and then um, some people, they may feel desire, but not as much arousal. And we've got, um, there's a lot of things that go into that. For instance, um, uh, desire is something that we um, often have to foster and create and um, is impacted a lot by uh, dominant narratives in our culture that tell us whether uh, this kind of sexual intimacy is better or worse than that, that kind of sexual intimacy. Um, also, well, I think I just lost track because I'm so nervous. <laughs> this, there's just a lot that goes into this. I'll probably say that a million times. Yeah, I mean, you're you're hitting on the the cultural aspect of all of this, which uh, our our culture is so much like our our vision. I mean, it's just it's in everything that we see that it's not until we like go to the optometrist and are handed our first pair of glasses or something, or or we take them off, or we have like an opportunity to play around with it, that I think we start to recognize that oh. 
it doesn't have to look that way or, or things are uh, maybe look differently to other people or to other cultures. And the longer we do this show, the more I am convinced that uh, it's not just the case that folks who grew up in, ch in church or grew up around certain types of religion have a bad relationship or have been like hurt in their sexuality the more I become convinced that just the presence of religion as well as about a, a gore billion other factors have just constructed our relationship with sex entirely. And it makes me really fascinated to wonder about what sex looks like for people 500 years ago or 5,000 or 50,000 years ago before the advent of agriculture and civilization and, and everything else. But our, our bodies evolved for a certain type of reproduction and that's very very different than what we see on on mtv or uh on pornhub or, or wherever else nowadays yeah um you know the, i i'm gonna I, you, you gave me two things there and the one that i think is more important is instead of thinking about what sex was like you know uh five thousand years ago i'm more interested in about helping people see that sex is different between every single one of us right now. Mm, mm -hmm. Because we have these narratives that say, oh, sex is, you know, two heterosexual people um, and it's going to be these polarized genders, male and female, and they're going to get in missionary. And um, uh, sexual intimacy really is so much more. And I hope to in some ways, get people curious about expanding the erotic canvas from not just our genitals, but to our whole body and our whole lives. And, you know, some of the research says that um, we can feel desire and arousal for emotional reasons, as well as sexual reasons, whether it's someone um, kissing us or touching our body in such a way that feels sexual, or whether we feel safe and emotionally connected to someone. Mm, I could you know, I'm, gl I'm glad that you brought up that it's such an individual thing. Uh, because um, when, when it, a lot of what, when I think of anxiety when it comes to sex, I, one of the first things that comes to mind is expectations. And depending on what society you're going up in, this could mean very different things. Um, there are some people who say that our society promotes hypersexualism. If you're going up in a different culture, it's that you are not supposed to have an interest in sex at all, right? And it makes me, it, it, I, I'm glad to hear you say that it's so much based on the individual because there are some individuals for whom sex isn't that big a deal and for another person it might be something like the most important thing that connects them to someone else yeah yes. and it's worth noting that uh whether or not it's quote a big deal to you doesn't necessarily mean whether or not you're having a good time so many people spend so much of their lives obsessing about sex without ever really feeling particularly like comfortable or playful or like they're really enjoying themselves yeah, I love the enjoying themselves part. And Puck, you reminded me that um, I have had so many people come to my office anxious about how often they're masturbating or how often they're having sex. And the thing is, is that part of that is because they have learned that it's not okay to be a sexual being. Mm -hmm. So a lot of our work, I think as therapists, is really just to normalize people's sexuality. Yeah. So with all of that in mind, if, uh, if our entire body is a canvas, if our, if our mind is a canvas, uh, mm -hmm. if all of these different pieces are part of our sexuality, it kind of brings the question of, of how mindfulness factors into our sex lives. Because I know a lot of people may be uh, sort of alienated from like their day-to-day -day anxiety. They may be coming home from work, kind of blocking out the stress of, a, of an asshole boss or of a really difficult day. And it's not until they start to become sexual and that they start to really connect with their body and start to recognize like, oh no, <laughs> there's anxiety here. And I, and I feel like people maybe start to associate that stress response to their arousal or to their sexuality when, when maybe it's just getting in the way. Uh, so many of these things like touch off of one another. And so I'm, I'm really curious how, how mindfulness can uh, help us out here. Ah, uh, okay. 
So two of the most important terms, terms are rumination and anxious apprehension. So rumination usually is a symptom of depression where we spend a lot of time thinking about the past, but you know, anxiety is uh, apprehension about the future. So whether you're in the past or whether you're in the future, you're not in the present. Um, mindfulness helps us to be in the present right now in the moment rather than in our head or in the future. When we're in our present, we're more in our body, um, we can tap in to what brings us pleasure, to what doesn't bring us pleasure. We can um, uh, be more in touch with what we want, what we don't want. So being mindful helps us to do that, but it doesn't stop there because there are like maybe a million levels of mindfulness. And I, I don't, I, I've never done the authentic relationship uh, stuff that I've seen around town, which I think is really cool in a, as a concept. Um, I have been working with modern analysis um, for the past three or four years. And uh, what I love about modern analysis, it, it is truly the work of becoming more authentic. And when I think of authenticity, I think of really being present. How am I feeling right now? Um, am I able to put into words rather than action what I'm feeling? Am I able to sit with the discomfort with what I'm feeling and self-soothe? Um, and when we're not in touch with what, are, what we're feeling, um, whether it be sad or disconnected or there's communication problems in the relationship or we don't feel good about ourselves, or our partner, then when we're not talking about that and we're not given permission to talk about sexuality in general, then anxiety is really great about taking over and saying, we'll just avoid all that. We just hmm. won't. Yeah. Well, if anxiety is uh, in a lot of ways like obsessing over the past or uh, worrying about the future, what are some of the more common causes of, of sexual anxiety? Ah. Uh, Numerous. Um, performance anxiety is one of the top ones that I think about. Sure. So we're having sexual intimacy and we're worried about whether the techniques we're using are um, working for a partner. We're worried about whether um, uh, we uh, are pleasing our partner, whether we look good, um, whether they still like us after this, if I tell them what I like and what I want, will they still accept me? So there's a lot of fear about negative evaluation from our partners. This looks a lot and could be related very much to social anxiety, which also has a fear of negative judgment from others. Um, now, that doesn't mean that performance anxiety is social anxiety. It just means that when we're looking at people who are struggling with these internal thoughts, or negative thoughts about their performance, that it might be something to consider. Um, other ways that uh, anxiety impacts sex, um, there are uh, things like medical conditions that, that can make us feel um, anxious. Uh, having cancer um, can really impact how our body feels, how we feel in our minds, um, can impact our lubrication, our erections and um so it's kind of uh, you you have to do a mental shift around being sexually intimate at those times and so that can create anxiety just having to transition where you are and to manage the grief and the struggle that you're 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 having with the cancer um another way that i see anxiety uh come through um is uh and this is really what got me into doing this research on sexual anxiety is that I was working with a couple that had very normal desire discrepancy. And that's where one of the partners wants intimacy seemingly more than the other. And I work with these couples all the time. It's a really easy thing to work through. You know, we just try to get everybody on the same page on what they want intimacy to look like. And then we have them start with some non-demand work towards getting back to a place where they feel really sexy together. And um, I was working with this couple and they were both gung ho, really willing to do the work. And the minute they got into a sacred place for sexuality, um, 
a just abject fear would come up. Mm -hmm. And that fear was much like a phobia. And, you know, phobias are sometimes really well treated by exposure response therapy. And at the time I referred this client to um, a, a CBT therapist and I didn't check to see if that therapist was sex positive. I, I don't know a lot of CBT therapists who are willing or able to do a sex positive uh, hierarchical fear um, uh, chart that will help someone desensitize to their um, anxiety. Um, another uh, example that I thought was really neat, and I, I heard this example from a psychiatrist conference, was um, it's related to OCD. Um, uh, this person had a fear that um, they would sometimes uh, pre-ejaculate in their underwear. And um, I guess I should have asked what we can talk about beforehand. Oh, yeah, no, <laughs> fucking bring it on. We're, we're here for it. <laughs> this, this is you too. <laughs> All right, excellent. Um, so they had pre-ejaculate in their underwear and um, it needed to, and, and would go to the local laundry mat to do their uh, laundry. And they had a fear that um, someone, some woman would get pregnant because of that underwear being washed at the laundromat. And so, you know, to desensitize to this fear, really this person had to go and do their laundry at every laundromat in town. And that way you never really know if every pregnant woman you see, if they're carrying your baby. So- uh, I mean, it's a possibility, right? <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's interesting. Um, how anxiety can show up. There's a million examples. So I'll just, yeah. yeah, this is good. This is the 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 puck sits back and learns episode because when I think of sexual anxiety, I think of only in very narrow terms. And this is good that it's opening up. Like for me, sexual anxiety, you know, before this conversation boils down to expectations and uh, standards and and normalization. Where you know, the, you brought this up a little bit earlier too about how some people are worried maybe that they masturbate too much or uh, not enough or don't have enough interest, and and how it might be perfectly fine for that person or the couple who has uh, you said uh, different uh, levels of uh, interest um, and. Some of the so so to me, the easing of the sexual anxiety is about realizing how okay this is and and how normalized everything is and 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 could be. Um, so, what would you say is the intersection between um, uh, uh, expectations and standards and normalization and anxiety? Ah, let me make sure I understand you correctly. Hmm. Expectations. Well, we'd want to explore them. Right? Whose expectations? Are there our parents, our pastors, you know, or the pastors of everybody else? Right? Like, you know, we have some or the strong Calvin Klein ad or, you know, a yes. million things. Thank you. And, you know, we don't know where some of these expectations come from, but we'd want to explore them. And then um, oftentimes it's normalizing our sexual attitudes and behaviors and um, busting some of the ones that don't work for us. So mm -hmm. if you want to masturbate eight times a day or none, you have the right. You have that right. And honoring each individual's right to enjoy their intimacy in the way that they want is a really important thing often. So that alone can reduce anxiety when people hear that it's okay to be doing what they're doing and that everybody has sex differently and you're allowed to have sex the way you want to have sex, as long as it's consensual, right? Yeah, um, no, nobody's keeping score. You know, there is uh, nobody in heaven with a magic book or a like good place point system that is tracking uh, the number of ejaculations you have or, or whatever else. Uh, but you, you, you talked about performance anxiety uh, as well as uh, you know medical conditions that cause anxiety and and all of those things. So it makes me wonder: is it more accurate to say that sex causes anxiety, or that anxiety interferes with our sex? It's both. It's both. And sometimes, like, for instance, um, sexual trauma can um, come out in our sexual intimacy uh, mentally as well as physical reactions. So which do you manage first? The, um, do you want to work on the sexual intimacy first or the trauma first that may be impacting the intimacy? So 
really the idea is to understand that anxiety can come from a multitude of places and it's you know um we try to take a biopsychosocial approach let's look at all the things um if you look at studies for um uh uh, uh vaginal and vulvar pain um you'll find that um like vulvodynia has let me make sure i'm not getting this backwards has a high um um, connection to anxiety and fear. So a lot of what we do um, to work with uh, people with vaginas is um, to help them to manage the uh, sensations in their body and the mm -hmm. thinking that's going on so that they can be in a more relaxed place. Um, yeah, I'm not sure I answered your qu question correctly, though. I mean, just the the simple reality is that it is both. You know that uh, mm -hmm. that sex and anxiety are often playing off of each other and getting off. Uh, you know, when we talk about anxiety, we are talking about such a big word that maybe it would be uh, useful in the future for us to to kind of narrow it down and, and to do this episode a little bit more specifically. But the truth is, I know the folks that come into my therapy office, and I, I have to imagine yours as well, are often just saying. I like sex, but I hate it. And it makes me nervous and I don't know why and I don't know what's happening and ah, you know, and, and that's often how anxiety exists for us. It's not as this like very clinical, well, you know, because of this experience when I was a child, I very clear, it, it so rarely presents like that. It's more just this like nebulous cloud of, of terrible discomfort. And, uh, and, I, and I think that that's worth noting. Um, but you know, we, we've got a, a call on the line, and, and I'm going to let Puck get that we do. up for us. But before uh, before you jump in there, Puck, uh, I guess I I wanted to just very quickly hit on something that you and I talked about before the show, Melissa, about um, how you know you, you mentioned like a, a CBT therapist that wasn't necessarily sex positive, and the reality is that a lot of sex therapists are not specializing in anxiety or anxiety disorders, and seemingly very few therapists don't have any real or meaningful training in sexuality. And so I, I guess I'm just really curious what the solution to that problem looks like. I mean, it, it makes sense to me that people are really uncomfortable talking to their doctors, to their counselors, to their to their whoever's about sex. Ah, well, you know, I, education, education, education. <laughs> <laughs> sure. But um, I, I, when I, when folks come my way, I ask them to see a doctor. When folks go to doctors, some of those doctors tell them to come see me. And I need more doctors to get sex education as well. And I don't think there's enough sex education for doctors. So usually what I end up doing is schlepping my way to each doctor in the area and, um, you know, saying, excuse me, did you know I can help with this? And um, I think if there are more of us doing it and there are more presentations and uh, workshops for people in the medical field, then we would have more reciprocity to help people with the mental and physical part of managing anxiety. Mm. And I want to talk about before, at some point, PTSD and anxiety and the stress response, just to mm. bookmark that. Yeah, for, for sure. We'll, we'll do it. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Puck, who you got lined up for us? All right. Uh, on the line right now, we have Jennifer, she, her from Florida, who wants to talk about anxiety around sex and asexuality. Hi, good good evening. Hi, good evening. So so my question, well, first of all, Christy, you're a nebulous cloud of terrible discomfort to describe anxiety was the most perfect description of anxiety. Um, and so on that subject, I'm wondering as someone who I've never had sex, I've never been in a relationship or kissed anyone, and I have a tremendous amount of anxiety around people in general, but especially sex. And lately I've been trying to figure out if I'm actually on the asexuality spectrum and, and that's why I'm not, you know, at this point I haven't had sex or if it's, or if this anxiety is kind of like clouding uh, my understanding of my own sexuality. Yeah, 
That's a great one. Can I jump in on this? Yeah, p- please do. Okay. Um, this is where I really respect the individual. It's really important to me. So I've had people come into my office and say, I'm ace. That's it. I know exactly who I am, where I am and what I'm about. And my partner can either deal or not deal, right? Like when people are pretty confident about how they're feeling about their sexuality, then yeah, we just, we just support it. But if you're uncertain and you're curious, then therapy is a great place to talk about that because we may find that there's anxiety. We may find that you're just, ah, I don't want to bother. Look at all that work. Yuck. I want to go to the beach instead. And you have that right. So um, does that help a little bit? A little bit. I mean, in my case, I very much don't want to be asexual. Like I'm a little bit scared that I am. Ah. Uh, because I want a sexual relationship. I want a romantic relationship, but it's hard in the real world. And I say the real world because I'm very easily attracted to like characters on TV. But then in the real world, when I'm out dating or looking at an app, I'm so anxious that I don't feel any kind of like attraction for these people or arousal or any of that. Yeah, that that is something that you could definitely work on. I think, you know, we'd want to look at where this anxiety is coming from, um, how you feel it in your body the thoughts that are coming up for you, um, the things that turn you on and don't turn you on. Um, There's a lot of pieces and parts that go into understanding your idea of your own sexuality and feeling empowered with it. Yeah, I I guess I would want to check in. Do you feel uh, arousal? Do you feel interest or, or desire in sexuality in situations or circumstances where you're otherwise safe? You know, uh, if you are, you know, watching a movie, whether that is like something that's explicitly erotic, uh, something pornographic even, uh, do you feel when you're in a safe environment, is it any easier? Is it any different versus when you're like, quote, out in the world or or in a certain sense of uh, danger or that type of discomfort? Well, definitely. I'm very easily attracted to characters on TV, Mm -hmm. like you know, I'm pretty geeky, so I love, you know, different shows, and I'll get very attracted to half the women on there. Um, oh, sure. Fan fiction, you know, kinky fan fiction, you know, stuff like that. I'm very easily aroused and yeah. attracted to... Jasmine those. from Aladdin taught me a whole lot about myself at a yeah. very, very young age. So I, I absolutely <laughs> hear where you're coming from. And, and, and to be clear, it is not... Uh, anybody else's job or business to look you in the eye and tell you that you are asexual or gray spec or anything else. That's a, that's not a question that you're ever going to be able to really answer until you just sort of decide, yeah, no, I feel certain about this. And, and that's what we're going to listen to. But if you're telling me that that's not the place where you're at right now, and, and that level of certainty hasn't been achieved, my, my hunch from everything that you're saying is that this is really more of a question of anxiety. And so finding ways that you can indulge your sexuality uh, that help you to feel safe might make sex, sex itself feel a little bit less dangerous. And uh, I really, really like to encourage folks to uh, enjoy things like uh, erotic literature or erotic audio in situations like this. If, uh, if you know, hardcore dungeon sexy sex pornography is, is kind of squiggy or, or is a little bit too close mm-hmm. to the type of sex that makes you uncomfortable, then perhaps explore in some of these other ways that feel safer But it may also be the case that, as we were talking earlier, that your sexuality is just being kind of interfered with or hampered by anxiety that has nothing to do with sex itself. And that's totally coming from uh, the social anxiety of, will anybody ever love me? Will I ever find the right partner? Or, Or even just, I really, really hate my job and I'm stressed out about money, so sex feels kind of gross and icky and, and unnecessary right now. All of that is is super valid, but if you are trying to answer the question of am I asexual or not, it, it might be worth really checking in with a, a therapist or, or finding some other professional or some other strategy to address that anxiety. 
yeah. Oh, thank you. That makes makes perfect sense. I I do read quite a bit of uh, you know erotic literature slash just fan fiction. Mm-hmm. Um, I've had a I've had a I went to a few sessions with a sex therapist who was not the right person for me. Um, mm. She just was not very aware of. Uh, she kind of seemed surprised by everything I said. I'm like, I feel like a bit of a, a bit of an oddity when you're talking to me, if you're surprised oh. by the fact that I've never kissed someone or, or the fact that I'm like into BDSM, but I've never kissed anyone, you know, I was like, so it's a little bit challenging to find a new sex therapist after kind of going through that experience. But yeah, that, that sounds perfect. super gross. And, you know, if there was like one surefire way to intensify your anxiety, I feel like the thing I would put at the top of the list would be some sort of shitty therapist that's going to be uh, working to like other you or feel or alienate the feelings that you're having. So I, I'm really sorry to hear it. Uh, I would say that we are uh, hopefully next week going to be having an episode where we specifically talk about how to find a good sex positive therapist that that might be right up your alley. Uh, but if uh, whether it's that episode or, or some other resource uh, like We Glimmer, uh, we did an episode last summer with a, a great organization that uh, helps connect women in particular with uh, great sex positive therapists. There are so many wonderful professionals out there and I I just really hope that you get to meet one and I I hope that we can try to facilitate that here on this show Uh, but please feel free to to shoot us an email with maybe some more particulars about uh, where you live or what you're looking for and if there's anything that we can do to help bridge that gap or make that connection as, as a therapist myself and Melissa I'd love for you to jump in here it just infuriates me and and breaks my heart that I share a profession with so many otherwise intelligent and talented professionals that are so ill-equipped to offer the support that somebody like Jennifer is looking for. And uh, it doesn't need to be that way. And it it doesn't need to be that way for you, Jennifer. Like There are great professionals available to you. And uh, I, I hope that we can help facilitate that connection in some way. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yes, this person was so enthusiastic and so, you know, trying to act like very sex positive, but so enthusiastic that they like were definitely othering. So, yeah, I hope that I can can find that. I appreciate that. Mm-hmm. And Jennifer, I just wanted to say that I love that um, you are interested in BDSM. That is definitely um Uh, a beautiful expression of your own sense of intimacy. Um, And I also love that you are really clear on what kind of therapist will work for you so far. Like you knew that therapist didn't work, then that's great. Um, That's, that's part of the hardest trick, I think. Yeah. Well, thanks. Yes. It's uh, I mean, I've actually been using after the first session with that therapist, I had a massive panic attack. And I was like, okay, maybe it's just sex in general that's causing me anxiety. And so I've actually been using this show as a form of like exposure therapy because for a certain period of time, like talking about sex or thinking about sex would make me cry. I mean, I'm crying now, but that's just because I'm nervous. And so like listening to this has actually helped calm the anxiety a little bit. So I'm very grateful for that. Well, we you know, we'll talk about it later, I'm sure. But we have a, a, a Discord and a Facebook fan group where you can continue to interact with the audience and maybe continuing to interact with a community that you know you feel safe with uh, will help you out with that. That's my only contribution. I'm sitting here between two actual therapists, <laughs> right? So I'm going to let you guys take over most of it. The, my my one plug is please continue to engage with us in our community and keep us informed on how you're doing. Please do. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. Also, uh, the oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, but also, um, uh, we're going to talk about examples for how to manage sexual anxiety. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're, we're going to jump into that here in, in just a second. Uh, yeah, Puck, I, I definitely want to turn it over to you and, and let you uh, grab another call. But I, I guess I just wanted to say very quickly, very personally, maybe even a little bit selfishly, that uh, when the ACA reached out to me about the possibility of maybe doing a show like this, 
the thing that was in my head was thinking about how incredibly uncomfortable sex made me uh, in coming from religion and how it was specifically listening to podcasts that I've called out on the show a number of times, things like Savage Lovecast and, and a handful of others and how that really, really helped me to get comfortable. Just being exposed week after week for an hour to all kinds of different types of sexuality that I had never even conceived of. And how initially there was a lot of things that made me go, Ugh. and there was a lot of things I was uncomfortable with. But after I left religion, I didn't just magically stop having that reaction. I still had a lot of those experiences for a long time, even if intellectually they didn't line up with what I believed or what my values were. And it was listening to that podcast each and every week that really helped me to feel more comfortable. And so the, the thought that I have had some opportunity to offer any of that here uh, through this show really just makes me grateful to uh, the ACA and to the donors and the patrons and, and everybody else that helps us to keep the lights on and to keep something like this out on the air. So uh, yeah, that, that's my rant, but, uh, but Pog, please take it from here. I uh, know. Uh, on the line right now, we have uh, Ethan. He, him from Illinois, had a question that uh, was right up what we were talking about. Uh, wants to talk about sexual anxiety and performance issues. Ethan, you're on. Hey, Puck, Melissa, uh, Christy, thanks for having me. So Howdy. I am wondering how I could uh, better get over my sexual anxiety. I was in a really long relationship that didn't go well. And I essentially went like eight years without sex, which shattered my confidence so that whenever I am newly intimate with someone, I get super overwhelmed and in my, and I can't perform if you catch my meaning. Um, and I am trying to experiment more and have more fun. Like this past weekend, I went to a, uh, a swingers event, but I found myself again in a situation where I was overwhelmed and unable to perform due to anxiety. Yeah, I I totally hear you on that. And a swingers event, that's like, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a, a big jump. It's kind um, of varsity level, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, um, I was trying to do, just throw myself into the fire. Oh, I see. Yeah. Well, the, one of the things I love about sex therapy is that, um, you know, I think most of us learned how to approach sex just however we learned and um sex therapy helps us to uh have sexual intimacy more intentionally so a part of how we have more intentional sex is to kind of slow things down um take time to what i call body map which is to figure out um, where on each other's body things feel good or don't feel good where what kind of pressure, um, you know, uh, what kind of touch. Um, and when we take our time, especially if we can add some sensate focus, I, I, I don't even like to use the word, but most of, mostly non-demand sexual intimacy, where we just enjoy the pleasure of our partner without expectation of orgasm or intercourse, um, then we start to learn really new and different things about ourselves our own sexuality, our partner's sexuality, and it becomes, I think, more endearing. That's my idea. Okay. I have one follow-up question. Um, any way to curve intrusive sex-negative thoughts? Because yes. I come from a, you know, it's a whole, what I'm doing right now is a shame and I shouldn't be doing it. You know, all the Christian stuff. Yes. Can Good I? Question. Yeah, please. Okay. So I have a couple of things that I like to use. Um, uh, one of them is a five, four, three, two, one grounding method. And it's really simple, but you can actually do it before sex and during sex, which is what I love about it. And the other thing I like to do is um, uh, I think it's Dr. Dan Siegel. Maybe it was his brother. I don't know, but um, they came up with an idea of labeling our thoughts for meditation. So if you're um, sitting there thinking thoughts while, and I don't know if you meditate or have much understanding with it, but um, when we have, like we're focusing on eating dinner and all we can think about is 
you know, uh, starving people in Africa. Our job is to intentionally bring our thought back to the meal that we're eating so we can be present. And um, what they came up with was labeling our thoughts as either helpful or unhelpful, old or new. Um, I'm sure there's some really great labels you could come up with. I haven't yet, but they could be fun. Um, this is the giraffe statement. I don't know. But the idea is that when you label a thought, you know, maybe you're going to a place of shame. Um, you could call it, that's a shame thought and bring your attention immediately back to the place that's in the present where you want to be. Um, that takes work and it takes time. Um, but it will help, I think, the most with intrusive thoughts. The other thing is exploring those intrusive thoughts and therapy can be really helpful because we can kind of get a better understanding of how those intrusive thoughts are kind of hijacking your, your re relaxation response. Um, right. And yeah, if that helps. Okay. Yes, it does. Thank you so much. And if you'd like, I can explain how the 54321 works in sexual intimacy. Would that be helpful? Please, I'm kind of curious too, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So the grounding exercise, there's a, a million grounding exercises, and um, there's a million ways to uh, relax our physiological response to stress and anxieties. But what I like about the 54321 is that um, uh, it the way it goes is you name five things you can see, uh, four things you can hear, um, three things you can uh, feel, two things you can smell, one thing that you can taste. And you can say these out loud or you can say them to yourself internally. And what this does is it helps us get in our body in the moment. So we're able to be right here, not anxiously apprehensively in the future, not ruminating about the past, um, not catastrophizing, right? We're right here, just paying attention to what's going on. So the way we do this in sex, if we find ourselves in our head thinking about this anxiety or that anxiety, we're not in our body. We can't connect with our pleasure or our partner's pleasure when we're in our head too much. So you want to use those same five, four, three, two, one. So five things I'm seeing right now with my partner, their lovely hair, their beautiful eyes, their, um, uh, their skin, their, uh, this bed, you know, whatever it is. And then you go through, maybe perfume. you're, yeah, maybe, maybe you're smelling the perfume or smelling that person's skin. And when you focus on the senses, it helps you stay in the moment. And if you use, Use that 54321 with bonding behaviors, specifically focusing on things that help you feel more connected. Touching hair, right? Or touching skin, these things will help you feel more intimate with your partner. Thank you so much. I am definitely going to try that. Cool. And the only thing the non therapist among the panel has to add to that is I would say, you know, don't feel bad if it doesn't work out immediately. This isn't like a switch that you can flick and suddenly tomorrow everything goes the way you uh, imagine it will. It, it probably takes a good amount of time and a good amount of, of, of dedicated effort toward this uh, before you can see meaningful results. Um, and uh, I had one more, but I completely forgot about. It. Oh, yeah. Um, the, the idea of uh, drifting thoughts, because I just had one right there. Totally normal. I mean, this is something that happens to a lot of people in sometimes the weirdest contexts where um, you you feel like you ought to be able to concentrate on this one thing, but uh, your mind drifts. Something will just suddenly go in there. And uh, that's why I wanted to hear what those grounding exercises were. This, this is something that sounds like it could really be useful. So keep at it. And uh, the same thing I tell everybody always uh, who calls in, uh, keep in touch with us in the community and uh, let us know how you're doing. Thank you, Paul, well, and Melissa. I hope you both uh, have a pleasant day. Thank hey, you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Also, one more thing to add to that is that if you look at the books on anxiety and anxiety management, there are a hundred million of them. I mean, that's crazy how many books on anxiety there are. And most of those books can apply to managing anxiety with our sexuality. So the trick with regular anxiety out there, generalized or phobias or um, social anxiety, really the trick is to find ways to relax your physiological response to stress and to manage your intrusive thoughts 
that feel right to you. So, mm. you know, for some people, they love exercise, you know, um, some people love um, creative visualization. So the main thing about this is that just like Puck said, it, it may not work for you. It may not, you know, using pranayama may not be one person's thing and it doesn't work for everyone with anxiety. So the trick is, is that there's a lot of um, exploration that goes into managing your anxiety. And what I love about that exploration, not that it's a pain in the ass and hard, but that it is literally a liberation of self. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and I guess just a word on that. I feel like we have to kind of tell people both things, right? Because we want to encourage people to uh, just stay curious, to not necessarily like rely on any one technique. Nobody can tell you what's going to work best for you. We can just sort of provide some opportunities and then let you sort of sample and, and taste. But I, I guess I also want to really stress to people that your anxiety is is something of a distortion of your body's like natural needs and reflexes, and that in order to really benefit from some of these things, you're going to need to maybe sample them more than once. And I, I know that that can be uh, kind of a kind of a. a shitty situation to put you in to tell you like, well, if it doesn't work, just try something else while also telling people, well, you have to be willing to stick with it. But unfortunately, there is a little bit of balance to be found between those two ideas. Do you, do you have any advice for how to, to maybe navigate that duality? Yeah. Yeah, I do actually. Um, uh, positive expectancy response. Um, which, you know, which is basically the same as the placebo effect. And when working with anxiety and uh, clients with anxiety, it's really the therapist's job to um, uh, immediately show that um, results can happen because anxiety is really a pervasive um, uh, problem with uncertainty, right? So if someone comes into your office who's anxious, they are... um, struggling with uncertainty and part of our job is to um, help provide a little bit of certainty that help is there. Um, One of my favorite examples of this um, is a therapist who did exposure response therapy for um, uh, fear of flying and he had people sign a informed consent that said at the end of the 12 week session um, you will rent a plane and uh, fly it, we'll fly it together. And um, what that informed consent really does is it reassures the client that they will be able to manage their anxiety and fear of flying by the end of 12 weeks. Mm. So a part of it is bold. (laughs) Well, it's also true. Mm -hmm. So if, if we can stay connected with our clients through their uncertainty, through their struggles, struggles and remind them that, this is possible, there is a way, then we're um, helping our clients to find a way through it. Because remember, anxiety's main MO is to get people to avoid. Mm -hmm. So people with anxiety, oh, I can't come to therapy today. Uh, Maybe we should talk about that. What's going on, you know? Um, Yeah, so it's it's tough sometimes, but uh, that is part of the work, is having and building that courage to be able to confront the discomfort. Hmm. Well, I I know we've already kind of opened this can of worms, but I I definitely want to talk a little bit more about some of these uh, tools for managing uh, anxiety around sex. So uh, talk to us, if you would, about the, uh, I guess, the dual stress and relaxation responses and and how that plays into our our arousal and and just our sexuality in general. Yeah, thanks for bringing that back because, um, you know, our human body has been an evolution and process since the beginning of our existence, right? And so we have a a highly tuned stress and relaxation response in our body. Um, So, you know, back in the old days, if we saw a bear, um, uh, our body would go eek, bear. And all the, our heart rate would start uh, beating fast. Our blood would start rushing to our limbs so that we could run or fight and um this was a good thing and because we're such creative human beings 
we have imagination, we could imagine if there's one bear, there might be two, right? So that's the anxious part of the stress response is that, ah, if there's this one bear in front of me, I got to get ready to fight and there could be a bear behind me. And I think we're pretty unique as humans having this ability to what if a situation. Um, I don't think other um, animals have that same ability, the what if. So having anxiety in a situation that's threatening or negative is not a terrible thing. Well, in modern days, we're not being chased by bears or whatever else. Um, we're being chased by bills and work tasks and, um, you know, families and who knows what else. And so what we've learned about the stress response is that it can be learned and um, uh, it can be anything that's negative can activate our stress response. And then what happens sometimes is if that stress response is powerful enough, um, if, if we uh, react to stress powerfully enough, that um, it can actually begin to hijack our ability to relax when we're stressed. So, you know, if my kiddo comes around the corner and goes, boo, my first reaction is to get stressed, right? I'm going to jump. I'm going to be, <gasps> and it goes straight to um, the back of my, you know, my reptile brain, right? It goes straight there. And then um, uh, I then can, my relaxation system, you know, so the nervous system has your sympathetic and parasympathetic um, systems. The sympathetic system uh, contains, manages all our arousal from this, you know, just the arousal of being alive, the arousal of coming from sleep to wake, the arousal of um, something scaring us or something exciting us. So my kid comes around the corner and says, boo, and I feel scared, but my relaxation comes into play when I go, oh, that was my kiddo. That's not a bear. I'm okay and I can relax. But the problem is, is that anxiety can hijack our stress system. So what we were finding out um, was, you know, people coming back from war with PTSD um, because the sympathetic nervous system manages arousal. Um, arousal and fear share similar symptoms. So for instance, um, arousal sends, uh, our heart starts pounding um, our blood starts flowing, but it goes to our genitalia and instead of to our limbs, our hands and feet, um, because it's a different process. And, but they're similar. So what happens with, with folks with PTSD is that their heart starts racing because they're sexually aroused, but it reminds them or triggers their fear that they've experienced. And the arousal, the sympathetic nervous system, the arousal just shoots up and bypasses sexual arousal and they just go straight to fear. So some of that has to be unlearned hmm. and it takes time. That was a uh, lot. Yeah, no, I mean, this is, this is super fascinating to me and I, I want to geek out on, on this kind of material all day while, while being mindful of, of the listeners. Uh, but it, it reminds me so much of a conversation we had uh, last December, I believe, with, uh, with Justin Sanceri uh, as we were talking about uh, polyvagal theory and, and what we can learn about uh, safety and how that impacts our sympathetic activation and, and just sort of uh, our nervous system arousal ratings uh, and so based on on that conversation and, and others I myself have always described sex as a form of mammalian play as, as a way for us to sort of like practice in a safe environment and work out some of our fears and I've always kind of imagined kink and BDSM as being maybe a, a somewhat like bolder expression of that same sexual play. How does that model line up with, with your thoughts here? Yeah, mine mine are pretty close to yours, except I don't see kink and BDSM as being bolder. I just see them as being extensions of our uh, possibilities for creative play. So for instance, um, one of my favorite things is sex in the disabled and sex in aging. Our bodies change. Our bodies can be impacted by and impact our ability to just have um, sex in a, a way that we might normally. 
So our ability to maintain intimacy through the lifespan depends on our ability to be creative and flexible. Um, so yeah, I love the idea of mammalian play. Um, it's a way to be intimate with somebody else and it feels good and we have the right to pleasure. Mm -hmm. I, I love Christie's encyclopedic knowledge of all his prior episodes. That was nicely going all the way back to <laughs> December and, and picking that up. Um, I don't have to go very far back to, to have a question uh, about something that was also previously brought up. And the reason I know that is because I'm the one who brought it up. So um, we had an episode a few months ago talking about uh, how role play can be used in relationships, specifically different kinds of relationship dynamics. Now, I'm not a therapist, so I stopped short of talking about the effectiveness of role play in therapy. So it was interesting to hear you talk about mindfulness, but the idea of role play kind of being to get out of your own mind. So where do you see... Mm role play as possibly being effective in therapy for this? Oh, role play, you're very much, I think role play, you're very much in the present with play. So um, when I think about um, any kind of role playing I've done from sexual to regular, I'm very much embodied in whatever persona or character I want to take on. And that's beautiful play. And you can be very mindful in that, in that moment. Um, I just, I want to, I guess I want to be clear. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I want people to really enjoy their, their way of looking at intimacy, their way of being in this world and mm. to find pleasure in that. And, yeah. I mean, no, no, that's fine. I was just, um, in my mind, I saw a, a separation between being mindful of you and, and, and the present and uh, being real role play, which is basically the exact opposite. To me, it seemed opposite, but I'm glad you were able to tie that in together to say that when you're role playing, you are absolutely in the moment. Uh, yeah. You are absolutely concentrating on what's going on right now. So that's good. Thank you. No, I, I think you've you've made a, a really great point, Puck, because it it does feel like you're you're out of your body in a certain way, you're out of your mind, you're out of your ego, maybe in a certain sense, because you're playing a character other than your own. Right. But that can actually make you feel more present because you you know, like you and I talked about in that discussion uh, around some of those roles. If you don't have to be a adult, if you don't have to be a person in that moment, if you don't have to be yourself, if you don't have to be an employee, if you don't have to be a husband or a wife or a whatever else and can just be a sexual being or whatever character you are in that moment, then it makes it a lot easier to kind of leave some of that distraction, some of that anxiety producing uh, distraction aside and, and maybe empowers you to be more present in a way. So I, I think that sexual role play can actually be an incredible way of overcoming anxiety. And uh, and yeah, I guess I'll, I'll just kind of continue to stack up some of these past episodes. I don't mean yes. to be too self-congratulatory, <laughs> but if you are curious, if you missed out on any of the conversations that we're, we're referencing here, and you feel like you need to, to bone up or catch up on some of these things, I'll make sure to have uh, links to those things in the in the show notes for this episode. Uh, but I, I want to kind of hone in a little bit because we've been talking a lot about some of the like cultural beliefs and expectations, whether they're coming from a pulpit or GQ or wherever else. And I, I guess I wanted to ask Melissa if there are any particular uh, beliefs or, or maybe even mantras that you would encourage us to like cling to as we're grappling with sexual anxiety. Yes, and I... I wanted to thank you. You you explained um, what you just said to Puck a minute ago was was really a, a better way to say what I was thinking. And I love the idea of fantasies because we want to really help people tap into the creative sense of pleasure. Um, so the mantra I would have is pleasure. We have mm. the right to pleasure. We have the right to enjoy our sexual selves, to feel empowered in it, to find joy to have it be as creative and as interesting as we want it to be. Um, and um, that's really the mantra. And I use a meditation by Gina Ogden that focuses on pleasure. Um, I sometimes uh, 
say this meditation over and over and over just to remind myself that um, my body is beautiful, my way of being sexy in this world is beautiful, and um, I have a right to it. And that's probably the biggest thing. And especially for mindfulness, it's really to help us get more to an authentic place, um, to be really present with our feelings, our needs, our sensations, and to be okay with that in the world. Are there any uh, beliefs or ideas that you would encourage us to, to maybe challenge or, or to cut out of our sex lives? Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll do a whole episode on that where we'll <laughs> reference back to this one at some point, I, I imagine. Uh, what, what, are, what are maybe some of the highlights here? All right. Um, sex does not come in one size or for one body or for any gender. We can have sex any way that we possibly find pleasurable and it's okay as long as it's consensual, right? Um, See, my mind goes straight to, I, I forget what rule number that is of the internet where no matter what it is, some form of porn for it exists on there. <laughs> so like my big thing would be like to the, the idea that whatever turn whatever your interest is whatever arouses you that it's okay i mean you know there, there's there, there's avenues and outlets for the safe outlets for that and and the idea was like i oh i shouldn't be turned on by something you know whether it's as simple as a, a member of the same sex or some you know it's, which sometimes some people are taught that you're not supposed to be attracted to but the idea that whatever you're attracted to it's it's okay there there's 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 probably a community for you out there mm. Mm. Really casual of you to pretend that you don't remember Rule 34. 34. Nobody's That's buying it, okay. Puck. <laughs> I knew it existed. I forgot the actual number. <laughs> oh, my gosh. There's a Rule 34? I don't know. I think the main thing, too, is that we should look at and challenge where we get some of our sexual ideas from. You know? Like... Um, yeah, like, who told you you're not allowed to like that? Like, where, where did you get this idea? Where did this come from? Yeah. Oh, my favorite is um, um, bumping uglies, right? Have you heard that <laughs> term? Yeah. Who decided that they're fucking ugly? <laughs> yeah, fair to say. And also just doesn't entirely line up with my appreciation. I mean, <laughs> I, I don't want to overstate it here, but yeah, oh. I, uh, I I think that there's a, a lot of beauty there. And I, um, I think it just highlights a lot of what we've been discussing about, which is that there are a million different words for our genitals. There are a million different little euphemisms and phrases for how we describe sex. And I, I think that that really speaks to the fact that we feel very uncomfortable saying penis. We feel uncomfortable saying a vulva or talking about sex and these different things. So we have to find these like cute little ways to avoid or, or to minimize sex by saying like, oh, it, it's it's just bumping uglies. Like it's just crude. It's just, you know, ways of like dismissing our sexuality so that we can maybe distance ourselves because it, it makes us feel a little bit nervous. It makes us feel a little uncomfortable. And I I guess I want to say to everybody listening that whether you have listened to this and a million other sex podcasts and are, are kind of just like over it and, you know, hearing about somebody coming in their underwear doesn't bother you at all. Or if the hair on the back of your neck stood up a little bit when I use that kind of vulgar term. I want to say that it, it's okay. Like your nervous system's response, like your reaction to any of this conversation is valid. But it's also something that is uh, at least somewhat under your control. And with a little bit of effort and time and energy and some of the practices that we've been discussing here by working with a sex therapist or, or whatever else that might look like for you, there's opportunity to change. I, I just have to stress... I'm a very anxious person by nature. I, I don't know how thoroughly that comes through the airwaves, but I, I think anybody who knows me knows that I'm I'm a very like uh, kind of anxious person, and I was very much raised to find sex to be uh, wrong to be immoral, to be a little bit disgusting, to certainly be very private and confidential. 
And yet somehow I'm, I'm here with you good people talking about these things every week. And the journey, while very long and hard, oh, thank you, uh, wasn't maybe a, as complicated as you might imagine. And, uh, and the, the tools and tricks and, and the opportunities that I had are, are things that I, I really hope exist for you who's listening because there really is opportunity for change here. Uh, now, I wanted to bring a point. Christine made a great point. This brings me back to performance anxiety. Mm. So I, I don't know about you, but I hear a lot of people talk about how they don't, you know, like there's, there's um, anal bleaching and there's vaginal surgeries, right? So, or, or vulva surgery. And the thing is, is that people think that their genitalia is not pretty. And that's because we don't give... This is without even acknowledging circumcision. Sorry to, to jump in here, but I feel like that needs to be highlighted as well here. Yes, right. And the thing is, is that we're not allowed to talk about it. So we're not allowed to validate our uh, genitalia. And so we have a bunch of people running around thinking that, oh, gosh, I, I, oh, I can't show this to anyone. And, this, and it's, it's just the furthest from the truth. These are things that people have put in our head. These are ideas that we need to challenge. And so often in my work, you know, I encourage people, look at your body. Just take a minute, get a mirror out and look, you know, feel around and find ways to enjoy it, right? Mm -hmm. Ugh. <laughs> No, it looks like we hit a couple of sensitive spots for, for, for both. It's nice to see, like, engaging in this. And the only thing I've got to add is that as often as, like, I'm sitting here on a show called Secular Sexuality with two therapists, and even I will still get anxious about bringing up certain topics, right? I mean, it's, it's even though it's the most comfortable atmosphere and I know that I can, I am still, like you said, that little thing going up in the back of your neck saying, wait a second, am I supposed to feel this comfortable about this? You know, it's it, this affects everyone. Like, And I'm nervous every time I do a show too. I've learned a few tricks to at least disguise it, but I'm thankful that I'm able to discuss it with the people who uh, 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 share, that, uh, share the experience with me. So um, I suppose I would just add that, you know, we're here to have conversations and, and, you know, on the various platforms that we have. And if ha continuing to have these or starting to have these conversations with us is going to be helpful for you, by gum, jump into the communities and join us. Yeah, I, I cannot overstress the value of being in community and, and being willing to talk about your sex life. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying that you need to like bore and bother all of your friends by telling them <laughs> every detail of what you did last night. Mm. But I, I do think that it is not only appropriate, but, but healthy and, and perhaps even necessary oftentimes to cultivate the types of relationships where you can be discussing some of your experiences, some of your interests and in, in these different kinds of things. Uh, but, but to that end, I, I don't want to get too far afield here <laughs> because there's a, a lot that, that I really want to make sure we cover. Uh, and while we don't have time for all of it, I, I wanted Melissa to at least uh, gently uh, broaden the subject of how to maybe support our partners if they are coping with a sex anxiety that, that maybe we don't share or maybe don't relate to. Uh, yeah, that's a tough one. There's some varied responses, but the first one that I think that I deal with the most is um, the minute a person with a penis struggles with an erection, and the partner's like, eek, you don't love me. You don't want me. You're not attracted to me. That's not the way to look at whether a uh, penis is having an erection or not. Mm -hmm. So we want to be supportive and curious. We want to also not make a big deal about how our bodies perform sometimes. Um, uh, we know that our body goes through aging processes, that stress impacts our body. Um, that some bodies are different than other bodies. Um, and so the more acceptance and education and understanding we can have around um, our partner's sexualities, um, that can do a lot to support any anxiety around it. Um, 
Yeah, we, we might be tempted to, to overeat or to eat past the point of being full when we're eating something that we really, really enjoy. And so I, I think that there's this like similar expectation that if I'm sexy enough, that, that my partner's erection is going to be uh, reflecting of that. And, you know, that's not entirely untrue, but it's also the case that the food can be absolutely delicious. And maybe you just ate, maybe you're anxious, maybe something happened at work today or maybe you just don't want to eat right now and all of that is valid maybe you even want to eat but for whatever reason you go to open your mouth and it just it tastes good but you just don't have an appetite and all of that is entirely valid and it's certainly not the case uh, for any non-penis havers out there that a erection is like representative uh, of uh, arousal or desire or interest or, or any of these other measures that we might be looking at. Oh, I love that you said that because, you know, um, when I was working on a book about sexual anxiety, I read a lot of research on um, understanding and defining the constructs for desire and arousal. And what we found was that not only did the scientists have a problem over time measuring arousal, um, uh, people who were experiencing arousal had different ways of expressing it and sometimes didn't understand what it was. So, you know, a thing that we'll see sometimes is um, heterosexual couple get together and the you know the woman will say oh i love you i desire you i want you and her vagina will be dry and so the partner's like are you sure you really want me because i'm you know your body's not responding the way it should and so erections and our physiological response to arousal is not the only tell for whether we are attracted and desire someone um, and so being able to listen and to connect with our partner and to have that kind of education and understanding, ugh, it's not easy, right? <laughs> it's not easy. Yeah, and that's that's pretty much one of the common themes that I've been hearing throughout the whole episode, which is basically the puck sits back and absorbs and learns episode because a lot of this was out of my depth. But the idea that like this is not something that's going to be solved quickly. Um, this is something that, that takes a good amount of time and dedicated effort, so... Thank you for making sure you put that in there. I, I really, I, I'm apologetic for our sex education system. Mm. Um, I think that um, uh, just some basic education would help uh, clear up a lot of anxiety around sex. Yeah, no, I, I definitely think that that's fair to say. Uh, and, you know, it, it feels a little silly that uh, that nonprofits like us have to kind of step in to uh, to fill in the gap in a lot of ways. Um, so so with that in mind, let me uh, see if we can rifle through uh, uh, some of these questions as we're getting a little long on time. Uh, I guess I wanted to ask if uh, you had any advice on how to find a good sex positive provider or uh, any type of professional that might be of assistance around these issues. Uh, yes. Well, I, I'm the direct person. So I, what I really coach people to do is call a therapist and ask for a few minutes of their time and just say, hey, um, how do you feel about working with someone who's kinky, who's into, you know, furries or littles or, you know, whatever else, right? Um, uh, and just noticing their response. And if you feel like they're responding in a way that goes, oh, yeah, totally supportive, or I know a lot, or I don't know a lot, but I'm totally supportive, then you'll know right away before even going in that um, uh, whether or not that person is for you. But sometimes what I find is that um, the relationship matters the most when it comes to therapy. So just being able to talk to someone on the phone sometimes is really the best idea. You get a feel of their temperament, of the way they approach things. Um, I tend to be very strength-based, and I also now put in a lot of modern analysis. Um, uh, so um, my... Therapy tends to ask a lot of questions. Um, some people don't like that. You know, some people want a specific kind of therapy. So sometimes that takes time to figure out. Mm, yeah, I can hear that. Uh, well, well, are there any uh, particular resources, uh, books, podcasts, or, or anything else that you'd like to recommend to us here? Uh, 
you know, um, I was thinking about it before the show and I can't believe just how much I read and, and how much I'm aware of. But I can tell you that books that have recently changed my uh, brain is um, Come As You Are by Emily Nagowski, which mm -hmm. I think is you know, uh, repetitive. I don't know how to do this. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, but brilliant and based on research that is really current and fresh. And she does a great job of really trying to put it into an easy to understand way. She talks about responsive sexuality versus um, spontaneous, which I think is a big learn for a lot of people, um, and especially for sexual empowerment. Um, Brado is, Lori Brado is another one that I think is amazing, Better Sex Through Mindfulness. Um, I think she's got other books, but um, she really is, I think, the first to really um, combine in a book sex and mindfulness. You know, you, you have like MBSR, which talks about mindfulness from a psychological point of view, but um, uh, we're really incorporating it into sex more. The New Male Sexuality is a book I like for uh, penises and um, I uh, also like The Guide to Getting It On and Girl Sex 101. These are great books, um, I think, too. Uh, I could go on. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, well, and for, uh, as I like to say, folks who are listening to this podcast as they are driving around or jogging through the park, uh, I will make sure to have uh, some links and, and some details on all of this on the, uh, the show notes for this episode. So make sure to, to check those out. And uh, yeah, we're we're gonna wrap up here in just a moment. But yeah. uh, Puck, if, we do, if you we like, do have a call that. actually. Yeah, so yeah why don't you pull that up for us? Have uh, one last caller for tonight. This is Ben. He him from Utah who uh, wants to talk about his experience with sexual anxiety. Mm -hmm. Hi, Ben. Hey, how are you? I uh, I sent you an email from Thailand about a year and a half ago. <laughs> I was. Uh, Possibly going to meet somebody, possibly have a relationship. Of course, I didn't. But I was just so anxious about it, just based on past experiences and religious upbringing and stuff. So I just mm -hmm. thought I'd check in and let you know that it didn't work out. <laughs> oh, sorry to hear it. What uh, what was the uh, I guess the the barrier there? Uh, how how did your anxiety get in the way, or or was that the thing that got in the way? Well, I don't know. It's just uh, I'm always so scared to get into a relationship. Just terrified. <laughs> and uh, I always find some way of talking my way out of it. And so uh, the lady wasn't cute enough or, you know, something's just I find some way to, to talk myself out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it didn't happen but you know I was there in Thailand I just got back in February so I've been back a long time well back, back just a short time but I was there a long time and had many opportunities but could not get anything going hmm <laughs> No, I, I hear that. And uh, when we have those kinds of, quote, failures and, and we start to, like, build it up in our mind as, uh, well, I, I messed up and I'm the common denominator and it didn't work out then and I'm still here, so it's not going to work out again. That very much becomes a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. And as we get more and more evaluative and we start, like, measuring our performance and we tell ourselves, well, because I keep failing, I, I must be a bad person. And become a, because I'm a bad person, I, I'm going to keep failing and punish ourselves and, and treat ourselves with this like really harsh and evaluative voice that says that we'll only be kind to ourselves if we can like achieve at a certain specific level and you must be at least this tall in order to succeed in life then we're, we're almost guaranteed to have that kind of reaction. And so I, I guess I would really encourage you, in addition to acknowledging that anxiety, to approach yourself and to, to approach relationships and, and everything else with maybe a little bit more compassion, to recognize that whether you are good at dating or bad at dating or however you want to evaluate yourself, to simply say that you are how you are. And if you would like to change, 
that you can do so with a, a little bit of time and effort and focus and attention and a, a little bit of loving kindness, that you can move the needle a little bit and change the way that you interact with folks. Uh, Melissa, what might you you add to that uh, as we're, we're talking about this uh, anxiety piece? Uh, I, I love what you're saying. I think it's also very difficult. Um, what's coming up for me is the idea of relationship OCD. And um, I'm not trying to diagnose you, so I apologize. But it, your statements are kind of reminding me of this relationship OCD where we get stuck in this uncertainty and doubt that a relationship will work out. And we just cannot get past those thoughts at all. And it's it's painfully difficult. Um, I, I don't know what's going on for you, but I'm hoping that maybe something about this show or any of these shows that you see on, on this podcast is something that might be helpful for you. And I do know that talking with someone about your struggles, your worries, your fears um, about relationships can help you find some freedom from those fears. And coming from a peer, yeah, just I'm thinking of just the idea that you are willing to travel so far to see if a relationship will work. It, that that's that says something to me. There's some people who don't even want to date outside their zip code, um, and so to to do as much as you are willing to do to see if a relationship will work. That's a huge step that a lot of people wouldn't be willing to take. So that's pretty impressive on my end. Yeah, I mean, for folks here in Austin, I mean, I'm usually not willing to date south of the river. So I, I definitely hear what you're saying. Like, that, that is a, a meaningful commitment. And I think it just goes to show that there is a, uh, a willingness to put effort and energy into these things. And that's going to be the most important ingredient in almost any situation. Yeah. Yeah, well, I was there for about two years and I was trying to retire. It didn't work out. But I'm going to try again sometime. And I think in the meantime, maybe I should see a therapist. I think it might help. <laughs> hey, I hate to be biased, but it doesn't sound like a bad plan. <laughs> And thanks for keeping us as part of the part of your community for the past year and a half. Mm -hmm. Very much appreciated. All righty. Well, so thanks for listening to my story. <laughs> thank you for sharing with us, Ben. Okay. Oh, Careful. sorry, I did cut off his goodbye there. <laughs> ah. Ah. Well, oh. go, sorry, go, 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 Chrissy, go. No, I, I guess I just wanted to highlight that uh, that we have said a lot. I think we have uh, been referencing like so many different past conversations, so many different books and resources, and and this is just a really, really big conversation. So you know, forgive us for trying to to fit it into ninety minutes, uh, but I'll say that we're we're definitely going to keep that conversation going. There are all kinds of links and resources and and different opportunities that'll be in the show notes for this episode. Episode. And we'll certainly hope to, to have Melissa back to be going into a little bit more detail about some of these particulars. Uh, in just a moment, I'm going to let Puck walk us out and, and let you know all the different ways that you can still continue to connect and continue this conversation through our different social media outlets and, and all these different kinds of things. But before we do any of that, uh, I really wanted to ask Melissa if you had any, any last words or any final thoughts you wanted to make sure to leave with the audience audience tonight because this is such a, a big idea that I, I think oftentimes the best we can do is to kind of hold on to, to some smaller notions to, to maybe just carry around in our pocket as we find ourselves kind of confronted with this like very nebulous, scary anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. We deserve to feel pleasure and we um, uh, have some control over our sexual lives. Um, it's not a spontaneous drive or libido. It is something that we can uh, make responsive. So um, if you're not feeling it or if it's not feeling good, then let's talk about it because we can create change. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for doing this show with us, uh, Melissa. Could you give us a couple of ideas as to where we can uh, get a hold of you or see more of your content outside of the show? Oh, uh, yes. Um, I'm working on an online training for therapists for um, uh, sex and anxiety so that more therapists can get trained in uh, sexuality issues. 
Um, I'm also, uh, you just saw my website. Um, I run groups. So anyone interested in working on anxiety and their interpersonal skills and getting in touch with um, a more authentic self, then definitely contact me for groups. Um, and I would love to be back here. I think it's great. Uh, I really, I also work with the Sims Foundation. I just want to mention that I have a love of music and Austin is all about music. So mm -hmm. I'm big at supporting um, Austin musicians. So if you're a musician, be sure to check out the Sims Foundation. Um, and thank you so much for having me on the show. It's wonderful. And I'm going to be here afterwards. So I'm happy to answer any questions or talk to anyone. Oh yeah, we're not we're not going away. We're gonna be uh, we're gonna be going to our Discord shortly. But uh, some other ways you can uh, keep uh, engaging with our content. Uh, we do have uh, the new AEN podcast network where uh, you can uh, listen to uh, the back episodes that we referenced here, along with uh, the Atheist Experience and the other favorite shows on the Atheist Experience Network, all in one shop at tinycc AEN Podcasts. Um, you can also engage with us on our Facebook Secular Section. Fan group. Uh, this is run by fans for fans at facebook.com slash groups slash secular sex FG. Um, and immediately after this, uh, well, give us about five minutes. We're going to be on our Discord uh, with a panel right down there at uh, uh, tiny.cc slash ACD Discord. Uh, we'll be going on there for an after show. And uh, there's many communities and many places uh, there to continue the conversations or start your own and keep it going. Uh, we have a fantastic line of merchandise. If you go to bit.ly slash AER slash AEN merch, there we go. I, I, I kind of want that throw pillow. I, I don't even have a good couch <laughs> to put that throw pillow on. I want the pillow just on principle. That looks awesome. And uh, I would be completely remiss if we didn't remember all the people working behind the scenes to make it so all we have to do is sit here and look pretty. Can we say hi to the fabulous crew? There we are. Hello, fabulous crew. Thank you very much for all you do. <laughs> oh, what a show. It's, it's never long enough, is it, Christy? Yeah, no, uh, for sure. There's uh, there's so much to cover, so much to say. And uh, yeah, if you're catching us live, I do hope that you will come and join us. And, uh, you know, uh, maybe in a slightly less nerve wracking environment, put aside some of that anxiety and, and maybe just join in the conversation with us. So uh, please do check a, catch us in the uh, the Discord after this. And uh, I guess in the meantime, Puck, uh, this is a, a really good time to encourage everybody who's not going to be joining us or maybe in the five minutes before to uh, take a quiet moment of uh, contemplative and calm reflection for themselves and uh, give themselves a big old orgasm. Or better yet, give somebody, give somebody else, else one. Five. Yes, please. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.